Grab yourself a beer, strap yourself in, and get ready because you're listening to the Clock and Talk on Arsenal Podcast. Welcome to the Clock End Talk. Thank you for listening. Thank you for downloading. You can follow us at Clock End underscore talk. You can also find us on Facebook, on all good podcast apps and YouTube. Uh, shout out also to our Spotify listeners. Um, I didn't realise we were on Spotify and had a little look there yes the other day and holy shit, we got heaps of follow- heaps of uh, listeners on Spotify. So thank you for you people who listen via Spotify as well. Um, each and every week, I'm joined by two chaps, but Schwinn wasn't available today, so I don't know, he's got his rags or chucked his fucking shitty, so I don't know. He's, he's got a bad back. <laughs> bad back, is it? <laughs> but anyway, I'll, I'll introduce you to Tony, he's, he's Mr. Reliable, always here, how are you, buddy? Mr. Consistent, turns up every week to give a 7 out of 10 in the one reality <laughs> podcasting world, apart from this week. <laughs> I was going to say, apart from this week. Um, anyway, we're going to uh, pre- preview the Watford game. We're also going to talk about the Napoli game, first leg, uh, as we go into the second leg. Just before we get into that, though, Tony, I want to touch quickly on, I don't know if it's come up in your news feed and around the world and whatnot with this Aubameyang racist business. Aubameyang? I've seen the Koulibaly. Uh, oh, sorry, it was Aubameyang speaking out in defence of Koulibaly. Oh, no, I've not seen it. I mean, you don't really need to defend him. Um, he's been... I mean, it was one idiot. It's not like it was the whole ground singing. I'm not trying to defend it. It's ridiculous. There's no room for it in uh, no room for it in society, but I don't really understand what you have to come out and defend Koulibaly for. It should never happen. The guy should be banned. He should never be allowed in a football ground again. Mm. Um, and... Oh. Well, the, 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 the most Mo Salary also came out with uh, and said that you know he's he's been a, a victim of racism as well. Um, oh, I just think it's yeah. A, I mean, obviously, there's a song that, that Chelsea fans was was filmed singing in Prague, and a few of them got uh, they didn't got their tickets to the game rescinded, and they got arrested when they were trying to enter the ground in Prague. Um, it, it's weird at the moment. It's like you get the, all these people that. It's like they think it's edgy or cool or to, to be different, which we see on Twitter all the time that people are just trying to be different for the sake of it. And it seems like they don't realise where the limit is. Mm. It's like you always get when, when, say, someone dies and you look in the comments and everyone's like, RIP, RIP, truly missed, blah, blah, blah. And there's always one cunt that's going to say something ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And... That's, I think it's just uh, I don't want to blame millennials but I feel like it is that just they just want to stand out they don't care if they're standing out for good reasons or bad reasons and it's like at the moment racism is the in thing that you know you're definitely going to stand out for mm-hmm. yeah, it's, mostly on like hidden accounts but when you start filming yourself doing it in a stadium it's just like, what's wrong with you mm-hmm. um, maybe clicks likes retweets things like that maybe yeah, that's what I'm saying. They just want yeah. to stand out in any way possible. They don't care if it's good, bad. They just they get their retweets. They get their look. The comments are negative. I couldn't take sitting sitting there all day and people calling me a cunt because of what I've said. Mm. But they just like I don't know what it is. They crave the interaction, even though from it's all negative interaction. Yeah, I just um, look just for those who haven't caught the story, and obviously this podcast will go out and you'll probably all know about the story. But Arsenal for Bemi Yang has revealed. Uh, his numerous recent cases of racism uh, in football and it's painful and dis- disappointing, he says. Um, uh, monkey chants were aimed at England's black players in the Euros 2020 qualifications. Abemia had banana skin thrown at him by a Tottenham fan. Um, so he's also talking things that have happened to him and then 
you know, with this drama with the Kula Bali and this one fan as well, and you know, chuck in the Mo Salah and a couple of other fan, a couple of other players. Oh, I think the players are just just had enough. And, and I look, I agree with everything they say because there isn't a need for it in our game. I, I don't get it. Yeah, I mean, the, the one a lot of people's resolution, or I'm hearing a lot of people saying about um, walk off the pitch. And look, I might be coming from this as a middle-aged white man, but I really don't think that's the answer because then the racists are winning. And the FAs in most countries, including England, are so shit that they will dock points or fine the team that's walked off the pitch. They won't say, well, because look, a team can't control their fans. So mm. uh, say, say Chelsea fans are racially abusing a player and that, that opposition team walks off the pitch. They're not going to re- they might give Chelsea a little fine, but they can't dock points off them because Chelsea have no control over the 30 odd thousand people in the stands. The FA will either take points or fine off the team that have walked off the pitch for, for not ending the game. So, look, something has to be done. But for me, I, I think that's the complete wrong way to go about it. I don't know what the answer is. And I'll probably get a lot of stick for this, but I don't want to see someone punished for being the victim. So yeah. it's not I'm it's not this is not me sitting here saying, Oh no, it's not really that bad because I know as a white person we're gonna get that. People going, Oh, you don't really understand and, and I probably don't because I've never been the victim of of anything racial really. But I also don't want them to walk off the pitch in protest, which I don't actually think would be a terrible idea, but then be punished for it. And and also, I mean, that game would either they're either gonna be dot points, they're gonna lose the game. So then the fans win because you ask some scummy fans, if you told them, oh, you can get a three nil win just by being racist, they'd do it, mm-hmm. which again, is ridiculous. So then the game would either be awarded to the team that uh, have the racist fans or the game has got to be replayed in a few days anyway. So I don't think there's anything to gain by walking off the pitch. Yeah, it would maybe create headlines. I think more like, I know it wasn't what well, it was race, but I know like in America where the players took, took their knee for the national anthem to show protest, and it worked, but it didn't actually disrupt the game. The game went ahead as normal. I don't know what the equivalent of that would be in football because we don't really have the national anthem or much procedure or anything. But something needs to be done. But I really don't think walking off the pitch is, is the right option. Yeah, look, and and you touch, you know, you're you're a single a, a white follower or a white man, but but you know, I'm on the other side of the coin, I suppose. I, you know, I'm I'm an Aboriginal Indigenous Australian, and and. Um, uh, I tend to, I don't know. I've, I've made and you know me pretty well now, and I just tend not to let things bother me too much. I just think, well, yeah, hey, right, okay. So it, you know what I mean. So I wonder, is that the right attitude? You know, just don't let a water off a duck's back. Like, don't get involved in it. Just look, one one clown singing out. You know, uh, fuck you, you black cunt, or something like that. That does doesn't does not phase me at all. I just I just look and laugh at the clown. Like I don't know if the players maybe. Oh, I, agree. I don't think, I don't think it overly affects them. Like as in, I I think they probably think the same way as you. But then it also does have to be highlighted because the more you keep letting it go, then suddenly that fan because they are craving the attention. If you just let it go, they're going to take it to new levels and. They're just going to keep rising and rising and rising mm. until they get so out of hand. Not that racism isn't, but as I said, if you ignore them having a racist chant, then they're going to do something else that's the next level above and the next level above, and it's got to stop somewhere. So I think the players are right in reporting it. I'm not saying they should suffer in silence. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Right, uh, um, so look, I just brought that up because that was <laughs> I, I jumped around, looking around a bit of news today, and that was the first thing that came up, and it was quite a few news articles on it, so I thought we'll just touch on that quickly. Um, also, I mean, to, yeah, yeah, the Arsenal the Arsenal one is an absolute bottle job as well because if you're going to do something, do it with conviction. Like, don't, I don't know if you've seen it, he's singing a song, I think he was like, he shouted like, Kula Bali is a fucking, and then whispered really quietly the offensive word and also typed it on his screen so the people that were viewing the story could see it. But if you're going to go that balls out and you want to be the big I am and the big man, at least have the bollocks to fucking say it properly. Like, again, I'm not owning racism, but if he's going to do it, don't be a shithouse about it. At least then everyone knows you're a fun. You're, um, is it talk over there much? And has, have they got him and you think they'd be banned for life? 
I don't know. I mean, last I heard, they were they were searching for him, but he, I mean, his his face. The, the problem is, he's he's probably brought his ticket off someone else, which makes it quite difficult. If he's like a, someone that just because it's not really a criminal offence, so but if he's just someone that's gone goes once in a while, they sit wherever they can get a seat, even though his face is there, they're going to find it very difficult to to track him um, in terms of like banning him from football games and stuff. If mm. it was on his own membership then he's a, an idiot because they'll find him they would have found him instantly yeah okay oh uh, we'll keep, keep an eye on that anyway look I, I at the end of the day I, I, I hope they ban him for, you know he's a fucking idiot at the end of the day I don't know I just don't know what thrill you get out of it like that's that's your fucking claim to fame well fuck no um Okay, let's move on from this this game, Arsenal Napoli. Uh, thoughts when the lineup come up yeah, with you, Tony? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I wasn't sure if it was going to go back four or back five, but beyond that, I think the team was pretty much what everyone wanted. We've been calling out for Ozil behind Aubameyang and Lacazette, or if not directly behind, at least the three of them in the same side. Torreira needed to come back in. Ramsey. Again, it was fitness because we all said at Everton we he was reportedly too not match fit to, to start the game. Mm. So Ramsey, we wanted him in, but we didn't know if he was going to be fit enough. And then at the back, again, we didn't know on Koscielny. We didn't know if he was going to be back fit, and, and obviously he was. Um, so I think a lot of people sort of predicted lineup before the game or what they wanted was, was pretty much that. Um, I know some people wanted Leno to be brought back in because he's our number one, but... Arsenal have always been a club of sentiment, whether you agree with it or not, and I didn't think there was a chance in hell that he was, that Leno was going to come in for Czech. Yeah, I thought, you yeah, know, I thought Czech did a pretty good job too. So, you know, we we did get a clean sheet after all. So, oh yeah, I know, but you're asking what my thoughts yeah. are when Leno. Came out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. Um, okay, look, uh, I usually try and break things up into two halves. So the first half, probably the first, you know, twenty to twenty-five minutes. Um, obviously Ramsey got the first goal in the 15th minute boy uh, it goes down as a Maitland-Niles assist yeah it's a really good goal it's really good football we won the ball uh, won the ball in our own half 60-70 yards from goal a few nice passes some good running off the ball I mean I think Ramsey actually made the interception uh, and then ended up being the one on the end of it putting it in the net nice movement zippy passing I think we changed the pace a bit as well. I think the ball went into the middle and it, Ozil played a really slow pass. I think it was to Ramsey who knocked it back and then Ozil just sped it up and then Lacazette made a quick ball. Maitland-Niles' run was very good. And it's a good finish from Ramsey. It's one of them that looks easy, but it was kind of stuck between his legs. Mm. Uh, he's, he's done well to dig it out. It was, it was a really good goal. I think we started really well and, and put the pressure on them and I think they were like a rabbit in the headlights. I said to you last week, you watch a lot more of Italian football than, than I do, but I was really surprised that... Uh, how bad they were, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. Look, and and I, I me and Glenn were talking about it earlier during the week too, and and they they're in a, just a slump. I, I don't know what is going on at Napoli, but they are in a really big slump at the moment. So, um, uh, what did we got there? Oh, twenty fifth minute. That's right. There was an own goal. Who got that again? Yeah, Koulibaly. Koulibaly. I mean, I'm not sure. If, I'm not sure if it's officially gone down as Torreira or, or Koulibaly own goal. Um, Look, we, we nicked the ball high up a few times and, and look, there's been a lot of stick over Aubameyang and Lacazette not really being too involved in the game but they they both pressed really well and they forced errors like that I mean as I said that time it happened to be Torreira that nicked the ball but if them two and Ozil aren't doing their job in, in terms of um, pressing their men then Torreira can't nick that you can't press on your own so yeah Torreira's going to get the praise and rightfully so but I think that's more of a team where the team presses He's able to do his job. Um, he's, to be honest, I know he scored, so you can't really criticise him, but he should have played a Bamiang in. There was two or three chances where he could have slid a Bamiang in one-on-one. He's done I'm mean, a mini shot weren't the best. It definitely won't go in. Mm. So it's not a criticism, but it's one of them things where you come out of the game and go, oh, Bamiang didn't really have any chances or didn't take his chances. But in in reality, the right thing to do would have been to slide a Bamiang in there and he has a one-on-one and you'd, you'd probably bank on him to score. Yeah, yeah. Uh, look, it was 2-0, that's the way the game finished up And, uh, you know, I'm not really going to talk too much about it We went in the sheds, 2-0 half-time We come out, um, there was a there was a little bit of a uh, I, I think the, the 
you know, I've swayed a little bit in Napoli's way, just that opening 10 minutes or 15 minutes, if I remember correctly. I think half time came at exactly the wrong time. As I said, they were they were a rabbit in the headlights, and and they couldn't get out of it. And we, to be fair, we kept the pressure on as well. We didn't let them ease up. And I think half time gave gave them that chance to just settle themselves. And I still don't think they were excellent in the second half. I think the second half was pretty even. Um, it said if they would have scored and it finished two one, or if we would have scored another and it finished three 0 it would have been. I don't think no arguments either way. We re- for me, we need that. We needed that third goal, and we had a couple of good chances to get it. But yeah. then they had some chances as well. So, well, I'll go. Let's go through them since you bring it up. So, look, I'm I'm just looking at a couple of stats here. Um, oh, look, by memory, obviously, a Yang had a good chance. Ramsey had a good chance. Uh, Lacazette had a good chance. Um, Shots inside the box for Lacazette was one, so I probably because I thought he had at least two. Well, no, but I mean there was one again. This is where stats are going to skew things because there was one where Aubameyang played it to him and he completely missed the ball. Yeah. So okay. So that's your, your, your shots chart won't register it. But I mean, for me, the Ramsey one is the is the big one because I was saying like Mickey's cut it back to Ramsey in prime position. I mean, ninety nine times out of a hundred, you expect Ramsey to score, and also. I was saying to the, the bloke that sits next to me, if you could choose what player that chance fell to, I'd probably choose Ramsey because what he done in, in, in spanking it over, like you've seen that from Aubameyang before. It's not You expect him to score, but you've seen him do that, whereas Ramsey's usually so reliable in that position, you don't really associate him with smashing a really good chance over or putting it wide. Mm-hmm. It seems to be when he does get that type of chance, he scores. Um, so, mm-hmm. no, that's yeah, right, yeah, it's just one of them, it fell perfectly and what happened happened but then Insigne had one in the first half where you'd pretty much put your house on him to score and he spanked it over as well now I'm uh, look uh, obviously Lacazette ended up coming off for a Wobie um, the, the strange one for me and you may think of this a bit different but I, I sit here every week and week in week out and I, I say if Ozil's had a good game or not and look I'm first to admit I thought he was very good good uh, against Napoli I, I liked everything I was, I, was, I was at one stage I'm going Fuck! I'm almost falling in love love with him again. Like just some of them, that's the skill that he was doing. And uh, that first, I think that first goal, um, it actually come from him to Lacazette, and then Lacazette put it in, didn't he? I'm so trying to think now. Yeah, yeah. He played, he played no. He played a one-two with Ramsey, and then it out to Lacazette. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, look. I thought he had a game, a good game in terms of the stuff he doesn't get credit for, so, like winning the ball back I think first half he again I hate stats but mm. I think first half he had six or seven ball recoveries which that indicates we're nicking the ball high up and it kind of shows why he was on the front foot um, he done he had little glimpses there was one I think he had a nice little nutmeg on someone there was one time where he ran between two defenders in a really tight space yeah. I, I, again it's another one I think I didn't think he was outstanding Um the thing is with him at the moment, everyone is either a ten or a zero. In well, everyone, terms of everyone, he's, everyone's looking at him so so closely, aren't they? Like that's I think. Yeah, that's but when do you ever hear him middle of the road anymore? Like, mm. uh, as I said, it's, as you just said, like, oh, you're falling in love with him again. So you either falling in love with him or he's the worst player on earth, and that just seems to be yeah, what's right. going on. Yeah. Like for me, he was a, a seven or eight out of ten, which is a good score, but. The way you read it on Twitter, he, he's never a seven or an eight, or he's never a four or a five. He's a he's a one or a ten. Mm-hmm. Well, I was a bit upset to be honest. And look, Mikatarian was pretty good when he came on. Don't get me wrong, but I, I'm looking at substitute Urzel for Mikatarian. Your thoughts there? Well, I think I said at the time that I think I thought they would settle for two nil and just think they didn't want to concede the third. Um and they would stop and but I think Emery thought they were gonna uh, come out really out and try and get that away goal so he just left our quickest players on so he took Lacazette and Ozil off for Iwobi and Mkhitaryan who are both quicker and both more likely to run in behind he moved Aubameyang from wide to to an out and out nine to try and stretch their defense I think he was expecting a real Napoli like session of putting pressure on and trying to hit them on the counter attack as I said I could never I never thought they were going to do that because two nil, I think they're still in the game. Three nil, it's over. Mm-hmm. There was a couple of late chances that they did have. 
Yeah, they had chances, but it wasn't yeah. like they were pouring the pressure and going like all out attack to try and make sure they got the away goal. Yeah, yeah. I think that's kind of what Emery was expecting. You uh, with his subs, as I said, you've got Iwobi that can carry the ball, uh, Bamiyang playing as an actual nine to stretch the defence, and, and Mickey is quicker than Ozil. Just trying to think that there was a magic cross that they. Oh, uh, uh, Zieleski shanked it over, went with the wrong foot. It was a magic cross over there, there yeah, and I thought, oh fuck, here we go. <laughs> but yeah, he, he hit it up. It went over the post, didn't it? Straight up and over. So, yeah, um, yeah. Look, that was my only worry. I, look, a way be come on for like I said. Oh, he actually, as like as it got slower. Was that? I just noticed like as it was very slow in t- at times, and and I noticed yeah. it more because I noticed Ozil trying to push the ball up to him, and he just wasn't getting there. I don't know whether their defence was sitting up a bit high too. I mean, look, to me, he looked a little bit off the pace uh, the whole game, to be fair. But he's never been quick. I, look, I've said, I've been saying this for years, and this isn't a criticism. It is what it is. But I, I don't. People associate him with being this quick, sharp player. He's very sharp, to be fair. But he isn't the quickest. He's never going to be the quickest. So I don't know where that expectation came from. Mm. And again, that's not a criticism. You don't have to be quick to be a good player. But I think sometimes expecting something of him that he's not is only going to lead to problems because then when he doesn't win foot races you're going to start moaning oh why didn't he get there why isn't he quick enough mm-hmm. but he's never been quick enough. you're just putting a false expectation on him mm-hmm. um, yeah no I just noticed I thought he was just a little bit off off the pace that was all and I, like I said they were, their defence was moving up on him pretty quick as well so it wasn't they weren't really allowing him a lot of room to move up front but I do yeah. anyway let, let I just think Lacker's... He definitely needs help up top. He, he, on his own, I, I don't like it. Like, we've seen it against Everton. I, I, I'm much... I don't want to get criticised here, but I, you know, because I don't hate Lacazette. I actually like Lacazette. But I just think we play better with the Bemiang up top rather than Lacazette up top. I just... Uh, for me, I think we need both of them. Uh, look, if I had to choose one, it would be a Bamiang, if I'm honest. And I've said this on here before but I don't think that's the right answer I think the answer is both of them but even if one of them shunt, shunted out wide and it will be Aubameyang if that happened yeah. at least they're both on the pitch there's two goal threats Aubameyang will tuck in and press it relies on Kolasinac being not an idiot which you can't always rely on but I think it makes us a much better team it also makes us we've been very very heavily reliant on our left wing attack I think if you play a Bamiyang on the left, it makes the right more dangerous because when crosses or the balls come in from the right, you know a Bamiyang's going to be at the back post. Mm-hmm. Whereas in general, when we're only playing one of them, we never attack from the right because you, there's no one going to be on the end of it. Mm-hmm. I hope you get something sorted for Watford game because we're fucking woeful away, so... What do we want? Well, yeah, I mean, it's it's an interesting one because there's a three-day turnaround between Watford and and Napoli Mm. and Socrates is out of the the Watford game. So, I mean, you've got him starting at Napoli 100% unless there's an injury. Mm. And then, look, I assume we're going to go over back five again. So there's two more spots. Does he play all three of Koscielny, Mustafi and Monreal on Monday and risk that if one of them gets injured, we can't play a back three anymore? Yeah, no, it's going to be bloody tough, isn't it? Yeah, it'd be, it'd be interesting. We're going, to, we're going to couple of questions on it, so I'll sit on that and think about it until we get to the questions, because I'm hearing what you're saying. I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, Torreira went off. El Nini came on. I, I just think that was, uh, you know, we want to keep Torreira fresh. Is he available for Watford? Yeah, he's back from suspension. I think he yeah. was just cramping up a bit because, obviously, he's not actually played... For us, anyway, he's not played a competitive match since March the second, I think it is. Mm. So, uh, yeah, I think he just needed. I think he was cramping up and getting a bit tired, and so they took him off. Took him off. Um, look, at the end of the day, it finished two 0 as I said. Uh, who was your man in the match? Uh, Ramsey. Yeah, yeah, it's very hard. Ramsey was mine as well. It's very hard. Um, I did. I was just looking. I put a poll up. And I wasn't being, ne- I wasn't trying to be negative about it, but uh, I, you know, I jumped on Twitter that after the game, and I just seen a lot of Arsenal fans criticising Lacazette, 
Uh, you know, and I put a poll up, scrolling through Twitter the day after yesterday's game, and saying lots of Abemyang should be benched, and I, I just think that's ridiculous. We got the win for fuck's sake. Like, why aren't you happy that we got the win? Um, I, also, I, I said I also thought Lacazette missed some great chances as well, so I thought I'd ask who was our worst yesterday and comment why. Um, Abemyang won the poll forty one percent, Monreal forty percent. I threw in Socrates just to see what would happen. Um, and Lacazette at 16%. It, look, guys, it, it wasn't a negative tweet. It was just the fact that, for fuck's sake, like, the criticism that came after the game, I'm thinking, we just won the fucking game 2 0, and now all these fucking fans are having a sook that Abamyang missed a couple of chances. All I'm trying to point out is, yeah, he did. Lacazette missed a couple of chances, and if you want me to throw Ramsey in there too, he missed one brilliant chance. As Tony probably said, that was you, you reckon that was probably the best chance that we had that was missed. Um, but yet we gave Ramsey the man of the match. So I'll ask you, Tony, and, and I don't mean this in a negative way by all means, but uh, who was your worst, I suppose? It's a difficult one because a lot of people were digging out Montreal because their only way they were attacking was the ball over the top of him at all times. But having said that, he was trying to cover two jobs. He was doing, because Kolasinac was doing God knows what, Monreal was coming to try out, trying to come out wide as almost like a left back while also being the left centre back. And he got, he got caught a lot of times between doing two jobs. So it's between him and Kolasinac for me because Monreal was the one that looked like he was making the mistakes, but it was because he was trying to cover for Kolasinac. We essentially left on, on that side because they played the front three but we left um, Monreal out hanging out to dry doing two jobs I guess because what you've got to go for Monreal because that was where the danger was but I feel quite sorry for him because I think if you only if he only had to do his own job that wouldn't have been a problem in behind he very rarely gets spun in behind but he was coming forward to try and stop the short ball because Kolasinac was having a picnic somewhere mm-hmm. and then getting spun in behind Mm-hmm. Yeah, look, I, I I would give it to Monreal, and it was there'd be no disrespect to Monreal. It was just the, he just did look a little bit. Well, not him. I, I think Napoli made him look a bit. You know, uh, show their strengths towards Monreal, and that was the type of where I thought there might be something come about um, on Monreal's side. So, um, look, Abemyang Lacazette. You think it's pretty unfair for people to be saying bench like uh, bench Abemyang? Um, look, I think they've both done a very good job in terms of pressing, pressing and also keeping the pressure on them and, and giving them something to think about. I don't think either of them had a great game with the ball. Um, look, as I said, I, I think we have to start both. I wouldn't be surprised if we don't start both on Monday with next Thursday in mind. I also wouldn't be surprised if we do start both on thir- on Monday and only start one on Thursday because obviously we've got a two-goal lead. Mm-hmm. Um but I wouldn't be calling to bench. Look, one of them will be dropped in our next two games. I don't think they were going to play two up top, both Watford and Napoli. But I don't think it's a drop in. I think it's more of a rotational, um, just managing our fixtures. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, let's get into some questions because we've got a few there. Um, scrolling through. Uh, David says, how do you think Chambers is progressing and do you think he has a place in the squad? Uh, he's probably been Fulham's best best player this season or up there. Uh, I don't think too many would argue with that. He's um, he's played a lot in central midfield and he's never going to get that at Arsenal. It's a difficult one because how much do you value a player that's been relegated twice? I think both times he's been out on loan at Middlesbrough and Fulham, he's done he's done well and he's been one of the better players for them teams. But at the end of the day, he's been relegated both times as well. So I kind of I don't see a future at Arsenal, and I'm not one of them that was saying that before. I actually quite rate Chambers. I just think the way circumstances have fallen, mm-hmm. I don't see a future for him at Arsenal. Um, but yeah, I agree. Yeah. I like Chambers, but the question for me, and you didn't really touch on it, but for me is depending on like, and people are saying that our budget is fifty mil, and then you know, depending on what we sell on that, like what, fifteen to twenty mil for Chambers, and then do you sell him, you know, and think, oh well, I use that for somebody else. If if he if he's only going out on loan, 
So for me, it'd be only a financial reason. Yeah, well, no, I look, yeah, as well. If he's not getting a place in the team, then there's no point having the however many million player sitting as your third, fourth, fourth choice. Mm. It depends how how cheap we're going to do things as well, we, because utility players are helpful. Someone that can play centre back, can play holding midfielder, an absolute stretch, can play right back. They're useful. That that type of player is useful. But from look, I mean, I can't see him still being there. Yeah, I wouldn't be against it if he is. Yeah, but I would be surprised if he's still there. If he's still there, uh, David Dave Squire says playing both Lacquer and Abemiang away from home. I think we should need to win at least three or four away games. Yeah, so this is going to be the hard one, and I hate the Emery. Yeah, look, it's 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 also the managing the games as well because you can't play them both ninety minute. Oh, no, they didn't play ninety, but the vast majority of the game on. Thursday gone and then play 90 Monday 90 again Thursday it's, realistically it's not going to happen um, I know we always think they're athletes they're paid however much they should be able to do it but they're also humans so it's the juggling look we spoke about this all season how many times have we had questions where oh, should he focus on the Europa League or the Premier League and I've always said that we have to wait till we get to a moment where there's actually a decision to make and we, we haven't had that time yet where but now we are now we're in that now is the time where he has a decision to make and I'm glad it's not my job nah well do you play one up top and do you give him a half each uh, I, I, I'm never a fan of going into a game with pre-played pre-made plans because don't, like football's football anything can happen hmm and so you're worried about one of them getting injured more so you'd rather well, not, even, not even that look for me and I think for most of our fans our strongest lineup includes both of them at the same time but they're both not going to be physically able to do 90, time, 90 minutes three times in a week home to Napoli away to Napoli and Watford away it's just not going to happen so it's not more injury I just think in terms of performance they're going to be knackered so they're not going to be able to play I mean not be able to play to the level they want and we want them to play to mm. so oh, it's going to be hard <laughs> yeah I mean look I, I think you have to rotate um, I'm not sure which one would suit what game or what game you play look there, there's a chance they could both play in one of the games and then they one plays 60 uh, say Watford and the other one comes on for them or, or comes on for the last half hour but I just don't think you're going to get 90 minutes out of both of them in both games Mm. I'll, I'll go to, oh, we've got another question in here from the plug Actually I'll read it now Because it was going to go into what I was uh, So Jackie joined us last week on the podcast He says do you think we will regret our chances We didn't convert uh, them, them goals for Napoli at home When we go there away Because and this is what I was going to touch on That I Personally I'd, I'd rather an Abemiang at Napoli Because I think they're going to, they've got to come out and attack, haven't they? they? They have to. They can't sit back. They can't play counter, counter attack. They're going to have to come out, you know, all guns blaze. And then for me, an Abemian with his pace would be better for that game. Um, yeah, look, it's, in terms of regretting the chances, 2 0, the game's not over, as I said earlier. Interestingly, last time we played them, I know it was a group stage, so it's different, but we were 2 0 up at half time. We stopped playing, we switched off, finished 2 0, and then we went out there and lost 2 0. So I know it was different because it wasn't a two legged tie, but we, there's history of, of this. Um, it's a difficult one. I don't think they'll go all out attack. I think they'll do similar to what we've done at Wren, whereas they'll play the game for the first 45 to an hour and see where they're at. Hope, I mean, they'll hope to be 1 0, 2 0 up. And then they'll they'll reassess from the 60th minute onwards. So I don't think saying just for pace because they're going to go and leave space over the top. I play a Bamiyang, but I would play a Bamiyang if if it only is to be one of them because you think if we do get wide, then he's going to be in the box, so he's going to give us that chance of scoring a goal. Whereas Lacazette will be brilliant with the link up play and hold the ball up, even though he's going to have a tough ask of that against someone like Koulibaly. But then. I think if we get a goal, the tie should be over. And 
look, just basic stats tell you if you, if you want a goal and you can only pick one of them, you pick a mm, Okay. So for some reason, our computer software just started to fuck up. Um, a cunt of a thing. I have no fucking clue why it did this. So I've only noticed as I'm editing. Um, so anyway, Tony will start talking about now. Um, uh, who asked the question? Troy. Uh, the optimistic Guna, he asked, not related to last night's game, but if Ozil created a heap of chances and none get converted, who's had a worse game, uh, Ozil or our forwards? So Tony goes into, and we, we're talking about, obviously, chances created and whatnot. Uh, this is where stats will never, ever work for me because chances created, it depends. If he's putting the ball out, five yards out and they're missing open goals five times a game, then you can't blame him. But if you say, oh, he's created 10 chances, but as I said, the way the chances created stat works is if someone's had a shot from it, you've created the chance regardless of where they shoot from. So if he passes the ball to Lacazette or Aubameyang who are 35 yards out and for some reason they decide to spank it into the upper tier and Ozil comes out of the game with 10 chances created, you can't say, oh, he's had a brilliant game. But then you also can't praise the strikers because they keep firing it over from 35 yards. I don't think it's an either or. I think sometimes Ozil does get a little bit of harsh treatment in terms of he, ch- he creates chances, but because people don't score from them, um, like he hasn't got an assist. And that's the stats. The, the two main stats that people look at are goals and assists. And sometimes he gets a bit of harsh criticism because people haven't converted their chances. Um, or he's got like pre-assists, which are never going to show up in the major stats. Um, but I, for me, it's not an either or. It's not a Ozil played well or Lacazette and Aubameyang played well. It it can coincide and and look, people miss chances and people miss passes. It's it's football. Then they're not robots. Um, look, <laughs> we had a big conversation on this fucking creating chances thing. From, look. Uh, I think the stat, the, the the creating chances stats a load of shit to start with. I like. I think the Premier League do one um, big chances created, and it's actually I haven't got the uh, the definition of it up in front of me at the moment. But it actually um, is a little bit different to the chances created stat. Uh, I don't know. You guys check out the definition of it. But so the chances created stat, for example, will allow you to. Um, a Mustafi uh, with a long ball to you know up up towards Lacazette, and then Lacazette goes through and, and he and he has a shot and misses it. Well, that then becomes a chance created. But if you got an Özil who puts the lovely through ball through and uh, you know and, and a and Lacazette, Tom, might, I don't know, he might drop it back to a to a Ramsey or something, and Ramsey has a shot and misses it. Well, there there is a, a that's that's a big chance created. So. Uh, there is a couple of little definitions around it, and I was I was reading about it the other day when me and Schwinn were talking about it because I just the chances created you could have a goalkeeper just kick the ball fucking way up whoop whoop and there's a chance created because he missed the goal, and I don't I don't like it at all. I just think it gets misused, and sometimes it it, it even. And I don't. I, I know this is going to people are going to say, "Oh, Tez is fucking on, on the Özil bandwagon." Yeah. If we take Özil out of the situation, it sometimes makes people use. I feel people use the stat to make a player look good on that game. If that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> um, so oh, I, I mean, just, I just think it's a shit stat. No, it is, and also like, say he's done it a few times, but I'm trying to say, like the Burnley game. That Ozil pass for me is got his pass of the season where he found Kolasinac at the back post who played it back to Aubameyang who scored. Mm. And uh, I think, I mean, you know what I'm talking about, the pass I'm talking about. But he, because Kolasinac didn't shoot, and he could have done, Kolasinac was in the six-yard box, but because he didn't shoot, that's neither a chance created nor a big chance created because Kolasinac goes down as a chance created or whatever, the, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. But that whole thing doesn't happen unless Ozil plays, as I said, for me, the pass of the season. Mm. And look, again, I'm not, I'm not using this to big up Ozil. That's just the example. So this is, uh, I don't believe in numbers. I never have done and I never will do. And I know there's strong arguments for numbers and, and stats and whatnot. 
But you you look at that and you say Ozil created that chance, hands down, with, as I said, the, potentially the pass of the season. But every stat will tell you he, if you read stats, he had nothing to do with it because he's not a, he didn't create the chance, he didn't create a big chance, he didn't get the assist, he didn't get the goal. So in terms of the stats, Ozil wasn't there. He wasn't there. Well, I was just and, and just thinking about that, the goal on um, against Napoli, because that all started from Ozil, but it went to Lacazette, who uh, tapped it into Ramsey, tapped it back to Ramsey, <laughs> was it? Uh, to Maitland-Niles. Uh, Maitland-Niles, yeah, yeah. But that started from Ozil. I wouldn't think any of the stat went to him. No, I mean, uh, I don't think he played a, a huge role in it. But again, it's look, it's the stats nonsense. There was another one, I think it was against Leicester, where Ozil played a pinpoint ball into Bellerin, who squared it across for a Bamiyang for a tap in inside the six yard box. But again, Hector got the assist, Hector got the chance created, Hector got the big chance created, not to get Hector. But again, that whole thing doesn't happen without one pinpoint ball that, that gets you in behind. Mm. Uh, uh, as I said, uh, for me, numbers don't tell you anything. Numbers with context, if you, then yeah, but then as just uh, watch the game with your eyes. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, Cosman Buddha, is this type of game plan uh, not a replica against a Premier League team just because they sit deeper? I presume he's talking about the Napoli game plan. I don't. I mean, we didn't really get in behind Napoli. I think that was one of the more pleasing things. We won without getting in behind. I mean. Our goals didn't, I mean, they kind of did, but they didn't really come from a cutback. I guess you could sort of class the first goal as a cutback. But, I mean, it was football work from inside our own half. And, and yeah, look, it was slightly a cutback, but it wasn't the, the type we've been used to. Um, I, I, I think we won in a slightly different way. I don't think Napoli were that high up. And as I said, I don't think we really got in behind. Or when we did, we didn't take advantage of it. Kolasinac did get in behind a few times, but... It ended up going to no one. Um, mm. So I don't know. I don't look. It's our home record. We've done that to everyone at home, apart from City, pretty much. Even, even Liverpool were the only other team to for us to not be at home. Well, and Wolves actually. Uh, even Liverpool, I think, if we'd have won that game, no one could have said anything. No one would have said we robbed it. So is that is that just our home form? Is that just what happens? Goodbye. Um, MWA Gunner thoughts on Fraser uh, possibly being a target Um, I've seen a lot of people write it off as in like they go oh no I don't want it I wouldn't want him blah 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 and would he be my first choice no to be honest but he's not a terrible player He, he always ranks well in terms of goals and assists he's very quick very direct Probably would, works very hard, very, very hard. He's not too physical, which I think would probably be one issue. I, I don't think it would be a horrendous sign. I think he's only got a year left on his contract as well. I, I'm not sure, but I, I know Bournemouth have been talking about extending, so I'm assuming, and saying all the powers in his hands, so I'm assuming he hasn't got too long left. Um, I, look, yeah, it wouldn't be my first choice, but I don't think it would be a bad sign. And it's not one of them I'd go, oh, for fuck's sake, we've only signed Fraser. Yeah. I think it would be an okay move, but there'd be people I target ahead of him. Okay, MWA Gunner. Should how we we set up against Spurs away be a template for when we play any away game? Uh, not any away game for me. Uh, I think Spurs, we were quite, I don't want to say negative, and we didn't like part the bus, but we sat back and tried to hit them on the break. But that's not going to happen against a lot of teams. Like if we sit back here like that against Burnley, Burnley are just going to smash it long and it's just going to be a battle in the air and your money would be on Burnley to win an aerial battle against us. So I think you have to pick your games. I think that's probably the way we should play against the bigger sides, the teams that are going to come at you. But you look at who we've got left, and I'm not, not including Napoli, in the league, Burnley, ain't. we're not going to be able to sit back like that. Leicester are a counter-attacking team, so you can't. Wolves are a counter-attacking team, so you can't. And what's the other one? No, Leicester, no. Burnley, Leicester, Watford. Oh, and Watford. And again, you could if you try and sit back against them, they're just probably going to go long to Deeney and then play off flick-ons. So I think all of them games, it's not really applicable to to play like that. But I think against the bigger teams that do try and play football against you, I think that probably is the way to go. Mm. Okay. Um, 
Clay Co Conservative, uh, do you believe Nears to Arsenal? N E R E S. Who? Nerez. I actually scored to Real Madrid. Uh, he scored against Juventus the other day. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, to Arsenal, um, legit or media mumble and jumble. Seems a good player, but his form in Champions League will will inflate his fee. Yeah, look, I mean, I'm not sure. I find it. I always find it difficult because he's had a good. He, he scored against Juventus, had a good game, and then suddenly we're linked to him. Uh, uh, for me, it's probably, or what my opinion on it is, is press going. Arsenal need a winger. He's had a good game and is a winger. He'd probably be available because Ajax are not going to hold on to their players. Let's link the two together. I don't think there's there's probably much in it. I, I don't think it will really he'll really be a target. He's only about twenty two or something too, isn't he? I'm not sure. He's not old. I mean, all of that Ajax team pretty much. Yeah. They're all young. Hey, I'd love anyone good. from there. They're all freaking good. That old fucking team. <laughs> I love that old team actually. Um. <clears throat> What do we? Uh, Vish says would uh, would do, do, D O U C O U R E do, do, who Decore Decore be a good replacement in the midfield when Ramsey leaves. Do you guys think Arsenal got the Kajons to smash Watford away? Oh, um, Kahunas is what I would say. But it's not that. Well, you didn't. You just said Kajons. <laughs> yeah. re- funny, I read it as it fucking says. I'm a fucking idiot. <laughs> You're right, I go. <laughs> um, uh, I'm not a big Decore fan. Everyone always goes on about him. I, I don't really... I think he's quite average, to be honest. Look, you don't replace Ramsey. As in, you can't replace him like for like. It's only going to be a downgrade, which is then only going to piss you off. Um... Kokore wouldn't be. I, I see what he means. A similar rangey box to box player. He's quite quick. He's, he, he covers the ground. I, I don't think he's a good enough footballer. Um, the, the the question I ask with Kokore is: Would you trust him on the edge of both boxes? So when you're trying to play out for the back and you've got the ball on the edge of your own box, would you trust Kokore? And for me, not really. And also, as I said earlier, when if the ball's twelve yards out, I'd probably pick Ramsey for the ball to fall to over pretty much any of our players. Would I say the same about the Corey? Again, probably not. So I think he's a decent player. I mean, they're talking about 45, 50 million, which for me is fucking ludicrous. Uh, I, I wouldn't go near him for that money. For my, I, and, I, I haven't seen much of Watford, so I can't really. So hard to over comment on. Yeah. And then. Uh, the, this is his have first season at Watford, isn't it? No, no, he had a really good year last year. Last year. Uh, so he couldn't get in their team for, for a while. And then last season, I don't know how what happened or how he got in the team, but then he, he's never looked back and he was really good last year. This year, he's not been too great. I know there was a time earlier in the season where Watford fans just wanted to get rid of him. I think they thought his head had been turned by being linked with all these big clubs. Um, but, yeah, I mean, for just, me... Just on that, just on that, and just with, uh, you know, Clay uh, mentioned a player, but somebody else down further, oh, Fraser, MAA Gunner. Um, you prefer these... Players, and I don't want to say shit clubs because they're not like the lower tier clubs in the English Premier League, more so than looking in the French Bundesliga, Serie A. Would you prefer an already established Premier League player? It all depends on the player. I mean, there's certain players, like, say, for example, Mares. He was a, a worse team, a, a not top tier Premier League team. I know he'd won the Premier League. Mm. Um, and but you knew he was easily good enough for a top four team, and you'd have taken him all day long. I always think when you're buying from abroad, unless you're buying the top top player, like when Chelsea got Hazard, unless you're buying that level of player, there's always going to be a risk when you're buying from abroad. I mean, look at Depay, went to United, completely failed, went to Leon, has been brilliant since. So th- there's always a risk. Whereas I feel like there's very little risk involved when you're buying from another Premier League club. Mm-hmm. What about Memphis the Pie? You like him? Uh, I wouldn't have him at Arsenal. No, okay, because he was another one I did see floating around the place. Uh, Cosman Butter, he says, is Schwinn okay? He's never been okay. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't. <laughs> yes, we have heard from Schwinn. We'll stop taking the piss. 
Um, to be honest, look, uh, Schwinn's got the shits massively with you listeners. He just can't handle the Urzel bashing no more. So he's, he's taking a, an extended break. Sabbatical. <laughs> uh, I could say he got, he got stopped at the Mexican border trying to get back into the US. <laughs> and not a good <laughs> um, uh, hope he doesn't listen to this. <laughs> uh, MWA Gunner, if Man City wanted Ozil and offered Mares, would you take him? Um, you just talked up Mares. I'm not sure. I really like Mares. I really like Mares. I think he's had a shit year. I think he needs to be not only playing every week, but trusted with the ball. He needs to be that guy that you like give the ball to Mares. Whereas City, he's the exact opposite. I think they look for every other option and then go to him. So uh, probably long term, I don't think it will work out for him at City. Would I take him at Arsenal 10 million percent? Would I tape him instead of Ozil? Mm, probably not, but there's a decision to be made there. But I'm thinking of the, the Leicester Mares at his absolute best. Yeah. The one that won player of the year. Um that that Mares, it's a tough one. I, I think I'd probably keep Ozil, but there's a, there's definitely an argument to be had. Well, just on on um, Chelsea and I, uh, as well as Man City, I'd imagine they, yeah, look, and I'm talking two teams here, but I'd imagine, you know, like Barkley, he's he's been one that you know talk drink water. Um, there's a couple of players around that Man City and Chelsea teams that. May move on in the summer. Is there anything there that you'd like to grab? No, not really. I mean, look, not City and never let anyone go unless well, they never let anyone go really. Yeah. Um, Chelsea, look, I think we should be finishing above Chelsea. So why are you going to take players that aren't good enough for them? Mm-hmm. I mean, look, barring the obvious in in Hazard. Hazard. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, that's not realistic. I don't think there's many Chelsea players, Kante has been another one, that I would actually want to sign to, to go into our first team. Nah. A couple of people will probably say Higuain, but when you've got Lacazette and Abemi Ingwine, oh, well, I would. Higuain. Yeah, I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't. Um, I th- yeah, I mean, look, he's one again, of the that- players that I think, I, I don't know what to say, but he's. I, I, I think he's... He's fluked his way his whole career, you know. What I mean? Like he just, I don't know. He's just one of them players for me that he just seems to. He seems a bit of a fluke. I don't know. He knows where the goal is. I mean, look, you've got to remember with Chelsea as well. If the transfer ban goes ahead, which it looks like it is at the moment, then they they're probably not going to sell too many players, and they're definitely not going to sell them to a rival because they're directly strengthening a rival and. And, and weakening themselves yeah. I think Hazard is probably going to go and they've already signed Pulisic to, to replace him but I mean like so say if someone yeah. said to me would I take William at Arsenal yes I would would they let him go to Arsenal this summer absolutely not hmm. so it's just yeah. one of them one pointless of them. conversations yeah, what's that on Sideshow Bob what's his okay. David yeah. Luiz yeah he, he looks like going too doesn't he but then again, about it, it, they've got that transfer. The transfer ban is a huge issue for them. They can't. The only reason they they would they will sell Hazard is because he runs out of contract a year after. So they will either get probably eighty plus million for him this summer, or nothing next summer. Mm. Um, I know what we've done with Ramsey, but I think when you're looking at eighty, a hundred million, a big difference. Oh, you can't let that go for free, surely. No. Um, MWA Gunner says How fucked are Chelsea next season Obviously yeah With a transfer ban That'll really fuck That will really fuck them actually Do they get rid of Sarri? Well I was listening to the radio As I was driving to London yesterday And They were saying that Chelsea are currently third They're in the They're going to be in the semi-finals Of the Europa League Because they're 1-0 up From the away leg Against the weakest side That are left in it Yeah and then they've got the easier semi-final in theory um, against Benfica, it looks like, or Frankfurt. So you're going, he could potentially finish third and be in the Europa League final and go on to win it. And everyone's talking about how shit he is. Mm, mm. It's mad, isn't it? Crazy. Crazy. Um, 
MWA Gunner, what was your favourite football season? Mine was 13-14, watching United play shit, Gerard, Gerard slipping, Arsenal actually spending big money on big players, winning a trophy after nine years and Brazil World Cup at the end. Hard to beat that. Um, did we win a trophy that year? Uh, 23rd, 13th, probably FA Cup. Oh, yeah, yeah, FA Cup, yeah, first one. Um, for me, oh, yeah, 13, 14 was someone we signed Ozil in 13. Yeah, I mean, for me, probably, I mean, I'm assuming he's talking recent memory, otherwise the obvious example is the, is the Invincibles. Um, it's difficult because I remember moments rather than whole seasons, like how I felt at that moment. So the best moment I've had in the last few years was the Ramsey winner against Chelsea in the cup final. I mean, it'd be very hard to top that. But on the whole, that was a shit season. It was the first season we dropped out of the Champions League. We wasn't even really competitive in coming for the top four. Um, In terms of whole season, you'd have to go to one we came second to Leicester because up until February, I think a a lot of people were not sure we were going to win the league, but expecting us to win the league. Mm. But I think more of moments. So when someone asks me to think of something great that happened with Arsenal, I, I may even think about that Welbeck header against Leicester. Or as I said, the one that comes to mind straight away is the Ramsey thing. I, I don't really judge seasons as a whole in terms of feeling and, and what I thought of them, unless obviously there's a trophy at the end of it. But sometimes the trophy isn't the end all. So as I said, we got the FA Cup, but we had a poor season. Yeah, look, mine... <laughs> And it's only just the recent memory, obviously, as you say, the Invincibles was brilliant. Uh, the, the our last FA Cup, I, I don't know. It just seemed like a just like a fuck you moment. Like, yeah, fucking you, beauty. And what was it? Wasn't it? Uh, we won the year before as well, wasn't it? It was two. Uh, no, we would had a year gap. Had a we year won two. Gap. That's right. Yeah, and yeah. Else. yeah. So it was that, that third, third. That you know, that most recent FA Cup. It was just like it was one of them seasons that. Everybody was a bit of a downer. It was, you know, Wenger, you know, his Wenger out brigade were in full force, and and it was it was a season that has, it was a bit of an up and down season. And or well, did we come second or less to that season? No, that was no the Chelsea year we came fit. That, that was yeah okay. So it was an up and down season, and then it was the FA Cup, and it was just you know what I mean. Like it was just the trophy, and it was brilliant. It was fucking new beauty. So it just didn't seem like a waste of a season. So. That was probably the most recent one that stood out to me. But that's what I'm saying. You can't, for me, I can't say that season I remember fondly. I remember that moment. Yeah, that and moment, I, I suppose. Yeah. I, I don't judge. For me, it's very difficult to judge a season. Yeah, yeah, no. Nah. That moment, yeah, because it was all like, yeah, fucking beauty. Um, MWA Gunnar, do you think the referees have given up on their jobs and life in general since VAR is coming? That referee against Napoli was fucking wonderful, I thought. Oh, he was terrible. Uh, I just think the standard... Look, the game is harder than ever to ref because the players are faster, the players are stronger, the ball moves quicker. The players are also much better at cheating or winning fouls or whatever you want to call it. I'm just going to call it cheating for the sake of this conversation. So, ref in the game is harder than ever, but the refs are also worse than ever. Just Not even just in England. The standard across everything is is crazy. And they're not being helped by... Like, I mean, the rules are, are just a joke. I mean, I, I went off about the offside at Everton last week. There's, I mean, that the, the Tottenham penalty or the Man City penalty against Tottenham, not a single player appealed. And I know with the current rules, it is a penalty. But is VAR not wrong when you have to look at something that no one even saw? I don't know. I don't know if it's right. It doesn't really sit comfortably with me. I mean, Schwinn asked me at the time, as it happened, he WhatsApp me and said, what do you think, penalty or not? And I was like, well, yeah, under the rules, yeah. Are the rules right? For me, no. And they're also different in every country. If that happens in the Premier League, it's not a penalty. There's no two ways about it. That is never a penalty in the Premier League. You go into, into Spain or Germany and it's a penalty every single time. And it's just, it's just a mess for me. Mm-hmm. So the rest of shit, but their job is is being made more difficult, even by their own employers, by UEFA or FIFA. They're making the ref jobs harder, and they're the ones that are employing them. I just think next year, I, I can I can assure you now, we're going to be talking a lot more about VAR. We're going to be talking a lot more about 
that decision was wrong by VAR. How did they get that wrong when they've got the fucking VAR? And I, I only know that now because that's the conversation we talk about in NRL, in A League, in Syria, and well, that's what I'm, you know, in my circles. I've, I, I, I watch three competitions religiously with VAR, and they are the topic of conversations week in, week out. And I think the, I hate it so much because it. It takes away the discussion of, fuck, did you see Ozil Tony pass that ball or did you see Bamiang's goal amazing? Because you're not talking about that on Monday. You're talking about how the fuck did VAR get that wrong? And that's that's just what I think we're going to be talking about a lot next season. Um, it's, it's here. It's coming. There's not much we can do about it. I just hope the crying out fucking loud that the Premier League gets it right <laughs> straight away. Well, I mean, look... <laughs> Yeah, for, for me, people are looking for it to be perfect. And I suppose with technology, it should be perfect. It should be 100%. But football is a subjective game, so it's never going to be perfect. For me, if it gets more right than it gets wrong and it changes decisions that are blatantly obvious that like, have, have, not, have been missed currently because, without it, I'm happy. If it improves the decisions by 10%, I'm happy. But I think too many people want it to be 100%. And with a subjective game, nothing's ever going to be 100% because me and you could watch the same incident. We could be sitting next to each other on the same sofa or next to each other at the ground in the same seats with the same view and something could happen. We could have completely different views. Mm. And that's not saying one of us is right and one of us that's wrong. It's just football is subjective. Is, yeah. So people looking for 100% from VAR for it to be bang on, accurate, no mistakes, it's never going to happen. But for me, if it improves it by 10%, 20%, it's an improvement. Yeah, even I, if it's yeah. exactly obvious stuff. But it's it's me, the moments, common. it's the it's the great moments that you see on the weekend, and and we talk about it now. Oh fuck! Did you see that goal by such and such? Um, mate, as a you know, and Schwinn will flick your video and and whatnot, and you'll have a look. Yeah, shit, that's amazing. I don't think that you know that aspect of talking about the actual game is what I hate about my other games I follow now because but, but that will VAR. <laughs> Only, that only gets lost if you're watching it live because if that goal happens and it gets given then video still gets sent around I'm still going to send the video of the guy putting it in the top bins from 30 yards mm. so I think it's only when you're watching it live that that, that comes that into that play comes in, the, yeah. the worst thing I think is it stops your celebrations are never as good because you can't full out go and I don't mean for the, I, or for the players also but in the fans, you don't want to be that idiot that trips over three rows, ends up going down the stairs. <laughs> you don't mind that when you've scored, and I've done it plenty of times. Yeah. But you don't want to do that and then look up and see a big screen saying no goal, yeah. someone's toenail was offside. <laughs> so I, I think that's probably the biggest error. And obviously I've related that to being at the ground because I tend to be at the ground. But it's the same at home. Yeah. You don't want to be running around your living room, putting something on your head because you've scored. And then you come back into the living room and your missus says what you're doing, you can't, it was offside. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I did that. I did that with Roma. <laughs> there we, yeah, thanks, VAR. We're out of the Champions League because of you. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I did exactly that and then went, what the fuck? I need to smash my whole fucking TV. <laughs> <laughs> but just, you know, for me that's the not the biggest negative obviously yeah, but I know, that's I know. one of the things it's like even like that FA Cup final we were just talking about against Chelsea I know it wasn't VAR but the flag went up for Alexis's goal and then the ref went and spoke to the Lions so we didn't really celebrate fully because we saw the flag up and then the ref went over to the Lionsman gave the goal but by that time it's a minute later and it's very you can't just if you, it's very hard to have the same level of celebration because a celebration is spontaneous, right? You see the ball go in and you just do, you don't plan it as a fan. You just jump up and down and end up doing something stupid, but it's not, you just do it. Mm. And when there's been a big delay like that and then the goal gets given a minute later, it's, do you know what I mean? It's not the same. Yeah, it's not the same. No, it isn't. It isn't. It isn't. And it's almost like your hearts, you know, you, you've, you've celebrated, you fucking new beauty, we got that one goal, we got the away goal, we're, we're, we're heading through to the next stage of the, you know, for that split moment and then next minute the old VAR comes up and takes it away from you and it's like, oh, fuck. <laughs> it's kind of a thing. But, uh, but if it gets the decisions right... It goes the other way, it's good, yeah. yeah. No, no, but even... look. Don't get me wrong. I, I don't. If we won the Europa League on a fucking offside goal and it didn't and it wasn't flagged, then I would still celebrate it. But 
I don't think you can ever argue when the decision's right. I mean, it's like you moaning about that Roma one. For me, the decision was right. So I, I understand your bitter coming from a point of it's your team, mm. but I, I don't think we should really argue when it gets the decision right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, Mike could be biased. Uh, could be biased. Um, 90th minute goals. He says, what is your starting 11 against Watford? We touched on that earlier and we, we, we really don't know, but we thank you for your question as well. I think that's about it. Um, just quickly, because you were not going to give me a prediction uh, for Watford and Napoli, um, but do we win both games? No. We don't win both games? Fuck. I was saying we win both games. I'd like to think, I hope we do. Yeah, I'd like to think 2-1 Watford. I, I, look, I'm pretty confident. This second leg, and I, I was talking to Glenn about it the other day and because uh, he said, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a bit of a... He sees it as what it is and goes, what do you call it, optimist, op, optimistic. Yeah, but he is a proper optimist. Yeah, and he, and he, and he'll say, oh, yeah, and I'll, I'll go, no, sweet, mate, we're going to Napoli, we'll be sweet, don't worry about it. a two-goal lead. Mate, we've only got to get one way goal. We're sweet. Don't worry about it. Don't stress, mate. We're through. We've got them sweet. <laughs> Where he'll go, no, 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 no. I wish I could be like you. So, oh, what's your thoughts going there? You think two is enough? No. no. I think we need to score. It's one of them. I think if we do score, we'll go through. Um, but I think we will need to score. Mm. Okay. It's like, well, it's, look, can you see us only losing one nil? Basically, is the question. Yeah. And I, I mean, if they score, they're not only scoring one. I just think they've been in such bad form lately, and I, I don't. And I know it's very hard because we have been in shocking form away from home, but they have been in worse form at home. <laughs> so they they haven't been good. They haven't been good at all. Look, and as Glenn said to me, one week the football they can they can easily turn that around. So. Let's just hope it's not the week. But they've also they've basically got a rest this weekend as well, haven't they? Uh, I think they. Oh, they've yeah, they've got bottom they of the league. They just played yesterday, didn't they? No, Roma they can't have done. We played them on Thursday. Roma played yesterday. Oh no, they no they. They've got bottom of the league. Yeah. Yeah, so they do have a rest. No, and they, they also. Yeah, they, they, they they've got bottom of the league. And also, like, second place is tied up. They're not going to come third. They're not going to come first. So they can play, basically, their reserves. And one, they will probably still win. Two, if they don't, it doesn't really matter. Mm. Yeah, they're pretty much good. Yeah, they've got second wrapped up. I think Juve, Juve, if they get a draw, they've wrapped up the title this weekend, I think. Yeah, but, I mean, even even Juve won't won't go for it anyway because they've got the big game midweek. Yeah. They might. They'll probably still win, but they're not going to, I mean... I'll be amazed if I see Ronaldo anywhere near the pitch this weekend. Right, so, yeah. Yeah, I know, me either. Roma did put the pressure on. There was a couple of teams who put the pressure on because, yeah, nah, actually Napoli are on 64, Inter's 57. So, yeah, there's a big gap there. So they pretty much got second wrapped up. I I just thought I was reading something that Roma or Inter, there's a couple there that, you know they might put the pressure on for second, but I don't. Doesn't I just had a look at the ladder? I'm not going to. So yeah, they can just play their second string team. Um, okay, so that's about it. But for us, uh, we have Watford coming up. Obviously, uh, we'll try and get a podcast out. I don't know if I'm available, and I'll have to see what Schwin Big Schwin Baby's doing. Um, so Schwinny boy, Schwinny boy. Uh, so we'll speak again soon and if not we'll come back after the next Napoli game thanks mate cheers too easy and thank you everybody for listening thank you for downloading as I say be every, each and every week you can follow us at clock and underscore talk we are also YouTube Facebook um, what else Spotify and every good podcast app you can get us on Thank and you. And some bad podcast apps, probably. Yeah, and some terrible podcast apps. That ain't, yeah, t- yeah. <laughs> nah, shut me mouth. <laughs> okay, thank you, everybody, and I'll see you next week. Good night.